Hello, this is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm excited to share with you the sixth lecture series of Church History, focusing on 1828, where the translation begins in earnest and 116 pages are prepared of the Book of Lehi, which unfortunately was lost. The translation of the Book of Mormon that we know it begins in 1829, but this period becomes a great time in Joseph and Emma's life and in learning, and this lecture will start by reviewing a little bit of what happened last week as we described Joseph having Emma and her brother as scribes. Last week I mentioned that Alvin had protected the plates and possibly done some translating, but we do have evidence that Reuben, her older brother, also acted as a scribe. We also talked about last week with Martin going to New York City and taking Joseph's early translation and Emma's scribal notes and the characters from the plates and asking if they were accurate. And he was convinced enough by their statements that he came back and he wanted to be a scribe. Lucy also wanted to join him. And so they both come down to Har Harmony, Pennsylvania. But it turns into a fiasco. And we'll talk more about that. And they have to return after two weeks. And Martin comes back alone April 12th and acts as a scribe then for two months until the book of Lehi is finished. And it appears that possibly the first chapter of Mosiah. We know then that Martin takes the 116 pages with him back to Palmyra with a strict oath that he will only show them to Lucy and her family and five people is specifically counted out. But that does not happen, as we know. On June 15th, we know that Emma goes into labor and has a very difficult time delivering her firstborn child. Alvin dies that same day, and Emma is near death for two weeks. When she finally turns the corner, she insists that Joseph return to Palmyra and find out what happened to the manuscript, and her mother comes in to take care of her. By the time Joseph gets to... Palmyra, he learns that the 116 pages have been lost. Moroni comes and takes the plates from him and the interpreters, except for a brief time when Joseph receives the interpreters again in order to receive the revelations that we now refer to as Doctrine and Covenants section 3 and 10. And then on that happy sacred day of September 22nd, the repentant Joseph is able to receive once again the Urim and Thummim and the brass plates. And we don't hear much about the translation between September and Oliver's arrival. The Lord tells Joseph that he's going to send him another scribe, and that's exactly what happens. We do hear, though, that Emma is healed enough in January that they are able to go and visit the knights and wonderful, generous Mr. Knight gives them food and money and shoes. But before we jump into this history, I just want to pause for a minute and ask, why do you think the Lord requires us to learn line upon line? We know that physically we have to, to develop muscle and cardiac stamina. We have to learn line upon line. A child has to look, is best off when they learn to crawl before they walk and then run and we usually have to develop our stamina by running short distances before long distances. But spiritually, we also have to learn line upon line. And it's fascinating to contemplate the advantages of this and how we are stronger and can battle with the opposition easier when we do it the Lord's way, here a little and there a little, as Isaiah describes. As we jump in to look at the translation, the different scribes tell us little details about it. Joseph just says it was done by the gift and power of God. But Emma says Joseph used a Urim and Thummim. William, Joseph's little brother, says that the Urim and Thummim actually attached somehow to the breastplate, and he had to use the two of them. And they, they were big and awkward and difficult. And it was time consuming. He also says there was a little pouch in the, the breastplate to keep the Urim and Thummim. And that's really fascinating because in the Old Testament, when we read about the breastplate that the high priest wore, 
with the 12 stones on it that, that each represented a different tribe of Israel. He also had a little pocket in the breastplate where he kept the Urim and Thummim that was used at times possibly to receive messages from God. But other scribes don't mention the Urim and Thummim. They mention Joseph's seer stone that he had found years before and that he had been using for quite a while, which now is used only for God's work, and words appeared on it, sometimes as many as a sentence at a time. I think Martin even said 20 words at a time, but that Joseph would be able to read them and they wouldn't go away until they were correctly written down, including being spelled right. And then the next phrase would come up. We also have different artistic renditions of it. Um, sometimes uh, the breastplate is worn. Sometimes it's on the table. Sometimes Joseph is using the book of the brass, the golden plates themselves. Other times he uses um, a, his hat to block out the light so he can see the words on the stone more easily. Sometimes the plates are present. Sometimes the plates aren't present. Sometimes there's a cloth or a sheet that separates the translator from the scribe. Other times they are not. And different artists have tried to pick this up at different times. They, it appears that Emma leaves us a beautiful report of what it was like. It's not given until later in her life when her son asks. And she says, this account is recorded many times in church manuals, but I think it's worth repeating again because it gives us so many details on what the translation was like from Emma's perspective, who was an eyewitness. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writings of the manuscript unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour, and when returning after meals or after interruptions, he would at once begin where he left off, without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. There were no delays over obscure passages, no difficulties over the choice of words, no stopping from the ignorance of the translator, no time was wasted with investigations or arguments over the value, intent, or meaning of certain characters. There was no references to authorities. By this, I think she's referring to either the Bible or dictionaries. All was as simple as when a clerk writes from dictation. The translation of the characters appeared on the Urim and Thummim, sentence by sentence, and as soon as one was correctly transcribed, the next would appear. Martin describes Joseph using the seer stone. So I wonder if it was faster and equally helpful. I don't know, but I do know that Martin was willing to make that journey back and forth multiple times to assist Joseph. And remember, this area is west of the Appalachians is, has only been opened a few years, and the infrastructure of things like roads are very primitive. These are probably dirt trails and in difficult weather of mud, you're going through forests and if you're fortunate, you're able to ride either in a stagecoach or on a horse, but it's a long trip and they made it back and forth many times. The first time Martin comes down, we know he's just going to take the characters to New York City. But the second time he comes down to Harmony, Pennsylvania, his wife asks if she can come. Remember last week when we talked about Lucy having this dream where she saw Lucy Harris, Martin's wife, she saw in her dream the plates and the angel denounced her for not appreciating the prophet and let her see the plates. And Lucy was able to describe them so thoroughly to Joseph and Emma that they believed she had actually seen them in the vision. She also gave $28. She was the first one to donate to the cause of the translation in the Book of Mormon. And 
she wants to be more of a witness and more involved. But when she actually gets down to their home in harmony, um, her nature changes and she insists on seeing the plates. Joseph tells her she can't and she goes on a rage and starts searching their home, opens all their cupboards. Fortunately, Joseph had been warned that the plates were not safe in the home and he had taken them out before this and hid them in the yard. But Lucy pulls apart their bedding and, and their um, tables and search in every corner and box and bucket and barrel and does not find them. She's convinced that it's a fraud since they're not there that she, and that people are abusing her husband. And she goes around to the neighbors and it is just recorded that Mrs. H, meaning Mrs. Harris, went from place to place telling her grievances to everyone she met, but particularly bewailing that the deception which the Joe Smiths was practicing. One of the neighbors takes Lucy Harris in so that she doesn't have to sleep with the Smiths, but my heart says many of those neighbors that she's going from place to place with in harmony are the family of Emma and they turn against Joseph and they no longer seem to be as favorable helping and Lucy Harris's effects are very detrimental and Martin finally takes her back up to Palmyra and returns alone and it's a very slow process initially. Joseph has now been working on the book of Lehi for many, many months. And Martin is able to finish it up using his turkey quill. And by June 14th, the 116 pages are finished. And he asks Joseph, would you please allow me to take them home? and satisfy my, my wife's curiosity and my, her family, her parents. And Joseph is so indebted to Martin for all the help that he's given that he just begs the Lord. And, um, oh, I want to tell you one other story. Let's go back. When Joseph is tr tired of translating, they go out and skip rocks on the Susquehanna. Martin's hands needed a break. And Martin is able to um, look around in the ground and finds a stone that looks very similar to the seer stone. And he takes it, and somehow he's able to go back into the Smith home, and without Joseph noticing, he takes that same seer stone and puts it in the translation hat and takes out the seer stone and tries to trick Joseph. The account reads, on resuming their labors of translation, he, meaning Martin, said that the prophet remained silent unusually long and intently gaining in darkness no trace of the usual sentence appearing. Much surprised, Joseph exclaimed, Martin, what is the matter? All is as dark as Egypt. Martin's countenance betrayed him, and the prophet asked him, asked Martin why he had done so. And Martin said, to stop the mouths of fools, which had told him that the prophet had learned those sentences and was merely repeating them. Martin worried a lot about what other people thought. And even though he had many witnesses, he was still skeptical to some degree. And that is helpful to be taken into account when we look at the loss of the 116 pages, because Joseph and Martin are both worried about what other people are thinking more than trusting God. And that is why Joseph's prayer, even though he doesn't say, do it my way on my timing, God, that is probably where his heart is. And that's why he is pleading for something that he has already received a no to. I feel like Joseph learned that you cannot pray that way. And I hope that we too can learn that same lesson vicariously. 
I really appreciate the definition that's given in the biblical dictionary of prayer, where it describes prayer as the time when a child has to learn to submit his or her will to the will of the Father and not the other way around. God always hears us. It's we who need to learn to hear and follow. It's always wiser to do it the Lord's way. We can always trust on doing it his way. And his timing sometime is dependent on our learning. But until we learn, it's always better to do it the Lord's way on his timing. The day after Martin leaves, the little baby Alvin is born and dies. We have different accounts of the experience. One account says that he was a deformed child. Another says that he was a stillborn. And Mark Staker has said that at that time, a baby was called a stillborn when, quote, the baby don't cry. But um, for whatever the situation was, it was a very difficult labor. And not only does the sweet little baby die, but for two weeks, Emma is near death. And Joseph does not leave her side. The record says that he did not sleep more than an hour at a time to meet every one of her needs. Now, I don't know if she had in um, problems with the placenta or problems with um, uh, an episiotomy bleeding, but whatever it was, whether it was sepsis or... There's so many things that can go wrong. She was really on the brink of life and death for two weeks until she finally turned a corner and um, asked for her mom to come in and Joseph to go up and check on the manuscript. Emma was as worried about it as he was. And so arrangements were made. And even though they don't have much money at all, they um, Joseph goes up. And we learn that during that two weeks... Martin Harris shows his wife the papers, and she is thrilled to see them and is allows Martin to keep the manuscript in her beautiful bureau. It's a drawer that she had never allowed him. They've been married for 20 years by now, and she had never allowed him to use this drawer, which tells you a little bit about their relationship, not just after Martin gets involved with Joseph, but even before then. And she offers to keep the manuscript there and they lock it and go away up to visit some friends and Emma and Lucy Harris stays with a friend and Martin has to get back to the farm and returns to Palmyra and while Martin is there working on the farm a neighbor comes by and says I heard that you have the manuscript I'd love to see it now part of that sacred oath that Martin made to Joseph and to the Lord was that he would only show it to five people and that he would bring it back. He has not brought it back. They have shown it to those five people, Lucy, Lucy's family members, but he also now agrees to show it to this neighbor, which was not one of the five people. And he goes to um, his wife's beautiful bureau and can't get it unlocked. The key's not, not there. He cracks the lock. He breaks the lock and scars, you know, scratches the wood while trying to pick this lock. And um, one thing led to the next, and the next neighbor hears that he saw it and comes by and asks, and pretty soon Martin takes the papers out of his wife's bureau, keeps it in his own bureau, and is showing it to multiple people. When Lucy returns and finds it, her dresser lock broken, the manuscript missing, and her beautiful bureau marred and scratched. She is furious and the volcano erupts and Martin um, is left to not only endure his wife's fury, but as we know, um, when Joseph makes the journey back up and arrives in Palmyra, it was a difficult day. Joseph takes a stagecoach to get there as fast as possible. Now, most stagecoaches worked 
um, night and day through the around the clock, and the horses were changed out, and they just tried to go as fast as they could. We are told in Joseph's mother's account or her memoirs that there was a passenger that watched Joseph during this time and remarked that he didn't sleep or eat during the entire journey and he was worried about him. And he asked jo- Joseph, what, what's wrong, sir? And Joseph told him that his wife was on the verge of death and that they had just lost their firstborn son. And the fellow companion had compassion on him. And when Joseph got out and he found the fellow stranger found out that Joseph still had 20 miles to walk that night in the dark, he he said, I am going to have to walk with you. I'm very worried that you will be killed if you walk in the wilderness by yourself because you're going to fall asleep. You are in no condition to make this journey. And so this stranger accompanies Joseph 20 miles and I feel that this stranger is a complete angel. And whether or not he was a mortal human or whether he's one of the three Nephites or John the Baptist or um, somebody else, I believe he was divinely sent by God. And he tells the family that Joseph would fall asleep even while walking. He was so physically spent. And when he arrives to the house, he tells um, the family that Joseph is so sick and that they need to give him a little pepper for his stomach. Stomach, Not something we use now after long periods of fasting, but Joseph really has not been sleeping much for two full weeks, and he his emotional stamina is as weak as his physical stamina at this time. And this wonderful stranger turns around after a small little meal and leaves by 6 a.m. And Joseph immediately has one of his younger siblings run to get Martin Harris. And Lucy prepares breakfast for Martin, and he does not come. And he does not come. And the family waits and waits, and Joseph paces the floor. And finally, six hours later, Martin slinks in. And um, the manners and the courtesies of that era are seen as the family greets Martin and encourages him to sit down to breakfast and welcomes him to the meal. But as we know from the account, as he picks up his fork and knife, he drops them. And Joseph then, according to his mother's account, who had smothered his fears and Till now, sprang from the table, exclaiming, Oh, Martin, have you lost the manuscript? Have you broken your oath and brought down condemnation, condemnation upon my head as well as your own? Yes, replied Martin, it's gone, and I know not where. Oh, oh, my God cried Joseph, clenching his hands together. All is lost. All is lost. What shall I do? I have sinned. It is I who tempted the wrath of God by asking for what I had no right to ask, as I was differently instructed by the angel. And then Lucy goes on, and he wept and groaned and walked the floor continually. And poor Joseph eats a little, sleeps a little, and immediately leaves at the crack of dawn to return to Emma. His mother records what happened in her account as well. We have a little bit of information from the Doctrine and Covenants. And her mother said, his mother recorded that Joseph said, Months later to her, I arrived here, and meaning Harmony, Pennsylvania, and I commenced humbling myself in mighty prayer before the Lord. And as I poured out my soul in supplication to him, that if possible I might obtain mercy at the hands and be forgiven of all that I had done, which was contrary to his will. And as I was doing this, an angel stood before me, and answered me saying that I had sinned 
in that he had delivered the manuscript into the hands of a wicked man, and as he had ventured to become responsible for this man's faithfulness, that he would of necessity suffer the consequence of his indiscretion, and that he must now give back the plates and the hands of the angel from he had received them, but said he that it might be you are sufficiently humble and penitent that you will receive them again on the 22nd of September. Interestingly, as Lucy recorded that the angel had said, he had referred to Martin Harris as a wicked man. We see the same thing in Doctrine and Covenants section 3 and section 12, 10, that he is also referred to a wicked man. And yet Martin was a believer and sacrificing time and money. Remember, a, a day's labor for an unskilled worker is a dollar a day. For a skilled worker is a dollar seventy-five. And Martin gave fifty dollars. You know, he he was making great sacrifices. Why would the Lord call him a wicked man? Well, I go to Scripture to look for this, and it's helpful to see. In the New Testament, especially in the book of John, in the book of Revelation, I mean, the author of written by John, you're either wicked or you're righteous. It is black and white. You are either the church of God or you're the church of the devil. And you are either working toward repentance and facing the Lord, or you're working as a servant of the devil. And in that situation, Martin's motives were wicked at that time when he was willing to show them to other people. And hence, he was called a wicked man. But I believe that just as Joseph repented, Martin also repented. And that's why the Lord allowed him to become one of the three witnesses, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. Section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants also says something so wonderful and so encouraging that it just makes me thrilled for Joseph to have heard the Lord tell him, but remember, God is merciful. Therefore, repent of what thou hast done, which is contrary to the commandment which I gave you. Thou art still chosen. Thou art again called to the work. But except thou do this, thou shalt be delivered up and become as other men and have no more gift. And Joseph's gift of translating was taken away from him. We're told in section 3, verse 12, the very next verse. And he was not able to use his um, gift for months. But when things were... I think this is fascinating that this is the first revelation that he receives and he has to have the Urim and Thummim to receive it. Later, he just recognizes that God is giving him a message and he calls out to the scribes to pick up a pen and paper and write it down. And one time when he gave a revelation, the scribes did not record it. And Joseph said, did you get that? And they said, no. And he said, grab a paper, I'll give it to you again. And he's able to repeat it. So Joseph learned um, how to receive revelations without the Urim and Thummim, but this section and section 10 were both given through the Urim and Thummim. When we look at the possibility of what was actually in the plates we come across some fast, not excuse me, the plates, but the um, 116 pages. We come across some fascinating information, and it's really been well explored by some scholars at Book of Mormon Central. And I'd like to show you a YouTube on it. I'm- In the summer of 1828, Joseph Smith let Martin Harris borrow the first 116 pages of the Book of Mormon's translation. Unfortunately, Martin Harris lost the manuscript, and its contents have never been recovered. But recently, drawing upon several lines of evidence, scholars have been able to reconstruct a number of topics, themes, and even direct statements that most likely were part of the 116 pages. 
First, when explaining the loss of the pages, Joseph Smith said in the preface to the first edition published in 1830 that it contained the Book of Lehi. This is supported by statements made by Nephi, who on several occasions stated that he was giving a shortened account of his father's writings. Nephi's account of his father's opening vision was likely taken directly from Lehi's record. We can find other references to what was on the lost pages by looking at perplexing references later on in the Book of Mormon that seem to refer to earlier unfamiliar events. These include references to such things as the account of Aminadi and details about what happened in Lehi's wilderness journeys. Also, later writers attribute statements to Lehi that aren't found earlier in the books of 1st or 2nd Nephi or Jacob. Surprisingly, the Doctrine and Covenants may contain information that can also help fill in some gaps about the 116 pages. For example, Doctrine and Covenants section 3 specifically mentions the seven tribes of Lehi. Their presence in this revelation, dictated soon after Martin Harris lost the manuscript, suggests that this standard list of tribes was an important piece of information found among the lost pages, as it reappears in the books of Jacob, 4th Nephi, and Mormon. Perhaps the most intriguing line of evidence comes from 19th century historical documents, especially from an interview recorded by Fayette Lapham. Lapham never became a Latter-day Saint, but he did record a discussion he had with Joseph Smith's father. Through careful analysis, one scholar has persuasively argued that Lapham's report does indeed contain several authentic details from the 116 pages. These include a story about Lehi building a tabernacle in the wilderness in the Old World, a wilderness journey by a group in the New World guided by the Liahona, the discovery of an artifact that can be reasonably identified as the Nephite interpreters, an encounter with the Lord at a veil, and a report of when the Liahona stopped working. These details are all fascinating because in one way or another, they help explain perplexing content or fill in missing background information about known Book of Mormon stories. Studying what may have been in the lost 116 pages can lead to interesting and rewarding investigations. While it is unfortunate that this information got lost, these remnants can help us answer questions about Book of Mormon passages that may otherwise seem odd or confusing. These surviving traces also show that ultimately the work of the Lord was prepared for and was not frustrated by this very disappointing loss. And now you know why.